couple of years ago, I went to ice cream college. No, seriously, it's a thing. So Penn State has offered an ice cream short course in the middle of winter, in the middle of nowhere, for about 120 years. And the whole thing is 10 days, and it's dedicated to the science of commercial ice cream. Now, most of the time when we think about ice cream, we immediately go to flavor. Chocolate, vanilla, cookies and cream. I actually once had an ice cream that was lobster flavored in Maine. I love lobster. That was challenging. But what makes or breaks great ice cream isn't flavor at all. It's texture, how it feels in your mouth. And that is all science. Ice cream is many things. It's an emulsion or a mixture of two things that don't want to be together, fat and water in this case. It's also a foam. It's packed with tiny air bubbles that are put in there during the churning process. And it's a multi-phase system. So it contains solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time. It's also delicious. Okay, so here's the deal. If you want to make great ice cream, you have to know how to control water. Now I'm not talking about superpowers or Captain Planet, or am I? All ice cream bases are mostly water, ranging anywhere from 55% up to 80%. And that water is incredibly important. As it freezes during the churning process, it thickens the mix and it turns the whole thing refreshing and delightful. Now the size of the ice crystals that are formed during churning has a huge impact on the texture of the ice cream. Smooth, high quality ice cream has ice crystals that are so small our tongues simply can't detect them. There's a lot of different ways to control water in ice cream base. Let's start with sugar. Now we all know that sugar sweetens, but it actually has an even more important role in ice cream, and that's to affect the freezing point of the mixture. When dissolved in water, sugar lowers the temperature at which water freezes. As more and more water freezes during the churning process, the remaining water has an even higher concentration of sugar, further lowering the freezing point. Here's what happens if you have too little sugar in the mix. It's rock hard right out of the freezer. This ice cream is unscoopable and it's not pleasant to eat. On the other hand, too much sugar gives you something that is soupy and wet right out of the freezer. That's because not enough of the water has turned to ice. Okay, next up, let's talk about fat. The fat in ice cream comes primarily from cream and milk. And the way that fat controls water is mostly by replacing it. Cream is roughly 36% fat and 59% water, whereas milk is about 4% fat and 88% water. Using a higher proportion of fattier cream to leaner milk means we have less water in the mix. And less water means we have less chance of forming large noticeable ice crystals. Fat also lubricates our tongue, so we're less likely to notice large ice crystals in the first place. But there's a limit to how much fat you can squeeze into an ice cream base. So commercial ice cream goes from about 10% fat up to 16% fat. At that high end of the range, we're talking about super premium ice creams, something like Haagen-Dazs. The most common formulation for commercial ice cream is 14% fat. That's the sweet spot. Too much fat in the mix causes two potential problems. The first is that during churning, that butter fat can actually break out of emulsion and form tiny flecks of butter. That might sound like a nice thing to have flecks of butter in your ice cream, but it's pretty unpleasant. Now the second reason that too much fat is a problem is actually really fascinating. An ice cream with too much fat won't feel cold enough to be refreshing, even if it's at the exact same temperature as a base that doesn't have too much fat. Now the reason is, is that water has a higher thermal capacity than fat does. That means that given the same amount of material at the same temperature, water can actually hold a lot more energy than fat does. So in an ice cream base, the water is able to pull more energy out of our mouths than fat can. The next way to control water is to limit its mobility. So adding starches or hydrocolloids like carrageenan or various gums actually traps water and increases the viscosity of your ice cream mix. So if the base is thicker, has a higher viscosity, there's less of a chance for water molecules to find one another to form large noticeable ice crystals. Once again, it's all about balance. Adding too much of an ingredient that binds up water and increases viscosity can give us gummy ice cream or something that eats like a pudding pop. Oh my God. Remember how good pudding pops were? Now I want one of those. Okay, that's a lot of ice cream science. I think it's time to go into the kitchen and see it all in action. The fastest way that I know how to make ice cream is with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen not only makes you look really cool, which it does, it also is really, really cool. No, like really cool, like negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit cool. We can harness that coldness to make ice cream really fast. The faster we freeze it, the smaller the ice crystals will be. So here's how you do it. We take a stand mixer and we put the ice cream base in the bottom of the bowl. Then we use the paddle attachment and we mix it on low speed while we gradually add liquid nitrogen. Made this way, we can have ice cream in two minutes flat. That's incredibly fast. If you make ice cream this way, you can pretty much ignore everything I just said and still make ice cream that is incredibly smooth and really, really nice. But let's be real. This is the ice cream maker we all have at home. And it takes about 30 minutes to turn an ice cream base. 
that is really slow. So the scoop shops that we love to go to, they have batch freezers that get the job done in about six to eight minutes. So if we got a slow freezer, which we do, we need a bulletproof ice cream base. That means milk and cream in a ratio that nets us that 14% fat sweet spot. I'm gonna blend the milk with a vanilla bean to extract tons of flavor. We're gonna strain it out later anyway. Next up, we're gonna add sugar and also corn syrup. And you can see the corn syrup is really thick. That's actually gonna increase the viscosity of the mix, which we know is a good thing. It's also less sweet than sugar, which is great. A lot of homemade ice cream can tend to be too sweet. Next, we're gonna increase the viscosity a bit more by adding some cornstarch. We're also gonna add some non-fat dry milk powder. It'll increase the viscosity a bit, but more importantly, it basically displaces water. So we have less water in the mix, less chance of making really big ice crystals. Okay, so I'm gonna heat this up. That cornstarch is gonna gel. You can see that we have a lot more viscosity. That's a great thing. Now we just chill this base in the fridge until it's at fridge temp, which is about 40 degrees, then churn it in our ice cream maker. We wanna make sure that that canister was frozen for at least 24 hours before we do this, so it has lots of chilling power. We're gonna let that go until it's 21 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's nice and cold. It's gonna look like soft syrup ice cream. Then we transfer it to another container. That goes into the freezer until it is hardened. It usually takes about four hours, but overnight is great. So all that's left to do now is scoop some into this bowl, top it with peanut butter cups, which I really like, and this is how to eat ice cream. Did you like that episode? Do you wish you went to ice cream college? Well, hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time.